Okay. I know we're going to have some. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I'm Dan Rundy. Uh, I hold the Schreier chair here at CSIS. I'm a senior vice president. And we're having a conversation about multilateral institutions and the future of work. The International Labor Organization at 100. Um, we're really pleased that the Director General of the International Labor Organization, uh, Guy Ryder, is with us today. Um, we're going to have a really, I think, wide-ranging discussion. I know we're also uh, recording this for a, for a larger uh, inter global audience as well, so thanks uh, for being with us. Um, if you're not here, but also in, uh, out, uh, out in the ether, in the internet ether. Um, I think we're doing some work here at CSIS on the future of work. Uh, I think, obviously, it's, it's high on the global agenda. Um, I think that the ILO is, as an agenda setter, setter capacity builder, convener, and trusted partner, um, has an important a role in the future of work. Uh, I think before we get to that part of the future of jobs and the future of work, I think it's useful for all of us to be on the same page about what is the ILO, uh, what its role is, why was it started, um, and some of the, some of the issues uh, that it works on. It is a uniquely trusted partner that I don't think we fully appreciate or understand in the U.S. And one of the things I want to get at is for uh, Mr. Ryder to share with us sort of the unique role that it plays in a number of different country contexts. Um, and then I do want to get at this issue of, of the future of work. Um, Guy Ryder's in his second term as Director General. He had a, he's a, uh, a, a, a British citizen, but has had an, a career in, uh, in labor, in the labor movement, if I can say that broadly, and then has also been, has had kind of a couple of lives at the ILO, but also in the larger global uh, movement of, of uh, trades unions as well. And um, so really, really pleased you're here. I think you have his bio, so I won't get into all the details of it. So Guy, thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. Could you just spend a minute, what is the ILO and why was it founded? Could you just spend a couple minutes just on that? Because I think that would be useful so that we're all on the same page. Great. Okay. Um, Dan, thanks very much uh, for your invitation. Thanks to everybody for being here. It's, it's really encouraging to see an audience like this uh, to talk about us. Um, the ILO is uniquely in the international system, uh, nearly 100 years old. We will celebrate our 100th birthday next year. So if you do the count back, you will realize that we were created in 1919 um, in the aftermath, not coincidentally, of the First World War, and really for two reasons. One, uh, because uh, I think the First World War focused people's thinking on the idea that if you want to preserve stability, you want to avoid conflict, you want to safeguard peace, it was truly necessary, and think back to the labor conditions of that time, to focus on improving conditions at work. Uh, and the remarkable thing uh, about the foundation of the ILO was the agreement of then 44 member states to bring not just governments together, but employers and workers to sit together as co-decision makers, workers and employers are not invited guests in the ILO, to work on the improvement of labor conditions. And classically we do that through the adoption of international labor conventions, international labor law. So we're the oldest organization in the international system the only survivor of the old League of Nations, as it was called. We survived, we became part of the United Nations. We are a specialized agency of the United Nations. We today have near universal membership, 187 uh, member states. Uh, the US, which was so instrumental in the founding of the ILO, it was Woodrow Wilson at that time, only joined us in 1934 because at that point the US went through one of its episodic bouts of isolationism on the international community. I don't know what you're talking about, Guy. We, we, we sort of feel that just we remember saying, those things. I mean, I know. It's just history, you know? It's just history. It's just history. Just history. Uh, you left us once from 1977 to 1980, but you're back there, uh, and, and boy, do we need U.S. leadership. Good. Okay, so we are the largest donor to the ILO? 22% of our regular budget. You're that's welcome. Common, oh, thank you. <laughs> Keep it coming. That goes across the UN system, so it's just standard assessment. It, it's our condo in the fees. United it's part of the condo fees of global leadership. You're right. Okay, so I, I think before we get to this issue of the world of work, why you guys have this tripartite arrangement? What was the thinking behind that? 
and talk about what that, what that, you know, how that, how that's operationalized in reality. Sure. Well, I mean, uh, FDR described this tripartite thing as a wild dream. Subsequently, he said, "How is it possible? Who could have imagined of government sitting with trade unions and employers and Woodrow Wilson?" Order? No, it was FDR later on. Yeah, yeah, no, no, but it. when he asked the question, I'm thinking Woodrow Wilson could have imagined it, right? Right, okay, a wild dream. Uh, and if we sort of just are talking amongst ourselves, we know that this tripartite structure, workers and employers having seats at the table, was in a part the payoff for the concessions made by organized labor to the war effort from 1914 to 1918. I think this is Sam a very Gompers important. I think this is a very important point that uh, that gets gets lost in the conversation. That this was that the ILA was stood up in essence as part of a geopolitical deal, right? Isn't that fair, guy? That that the labor unions, if you guys will work extra hours to help us win the war effort to end World War One, to the war to end all wars. We're gonna, at the end of the war, we're gonna sit down and we're gonna revisit sort of the, the social contract. Is that a fair way to describe it? With two extra ingredients. Yeah. One, let's not forget the Bolshevik Revolution. That really I think this is very, very minds. important. By the way, as long, uh, in addition to the US not joining the ILO at the beginning, the Soviet Union absolutely hated the ILO. Really? This was the cold water <gasps> that would dampen the revolutionary uh, fervor of the masses. This was the reformist agenda for labor, which the Soviet Union absolutely despised, and despised well into the history of the organization. But, you know, we're looking at this in very, very hard terms. There is, and I don't want to trivialize this, a massive dose of idealism and principle in the foundation of our organization. If any of you can get on the internet and you have no more than 20 seconds to spend Please read the preamble to the Constitution of the ILO, written in 1919. It's two paragraphs. It's a beautiful statement of why we need to take care of the world of work as a guarantor of fairness in society and peace and stability in our society. Updated in 1944 with an even more, in my mind, beautiful decoration of Philadelphia. These are short and wonderful texts which says a lot about, about I think, the challenges we face in the future of work. So, okay, so the issue of one of the things I've been struck by, we did an event here on world, the 100th anniversary of World War I, and the, uh, the, we had historians look at this. It was shocking to me that we couldn't get, that there's a US commission on the 100th anniversary of World War I. It's, I think it's embarrassing. Uh, my grandfather was in the Second World War, was served with George Patton. And um, it's embarrassing to me that it's sort of the forgotten war, but it, it was, it's, it's so much has shaped the, it's shaped the, the world that we're in and um, many of the, uh, the world that we, we see. And one of the interesting things that this historian said was that um, we had, uh, that there was a picture of the woman who was the professor from the University of Florida put up. It was Woodrow Wilson between J.P. Morgan and Vladimir Lenin saying, that he needed to, the 14 points and things like the ILO were part of trying to create a, trying to save capitalism from either the, the rapacious capitalism on the one hand, which was, as, which was generating antibodies, as well as sort of the Bolshevik revolution, which was just, you know, a disaster. And anyone, you know, socialism killed millions of people. You know, the, the communist revolutions have killed millions of people in the 20th century. And that they knew that was a terrible outcome as well. So this was a way to, a third way to try and save, to save sort of a social contract. The other thing I think is interesting about World War I is I know a little bit about Puerto Rico. And in Puerto Rico, the deal that was cut similar to with the labor unions was um, you're kind of a US colony or you're a US colony. Um, we'll give you citizenship in the United States if you'll send your, your boys, because it was boys at the time, you send your boys to fight in World War I, the deal we'll make is we'll make you citizens. So similar to the labor unions, there were some deals cut to try to help the war effort on a number of different fronts. So I think it's very interesting sort of the geopolitical origins of your, of your organization. Talk about the tripartite nature of it though. There's, it's interesting, we were having a pregame conversation and I was struck by some of the representatives from companies. So how do you interact with companies? How are you, how are you governed? Okay, so if you were to come to the ILO's annual conference or to 
our executive, which is called a governing body, you walk into the room, it's rather like this room. You are the governments. You are the employers. You are the trade unions. And that's exactly how our decision making is structured. Except there are two times as many governments. So it's 50% governments, 25% employers, 25% workers. All decision making in our organization, and if there's a vote, that's how the votes pan out, works like that. Now, you might say, that's very interesting, it's very noble, but isn't this a recipe for absolute stalemate and immobility? The governments will do one thing, the employers and workers will oppose each other, and you go nowhere. That might be one view of what you get when governments, employers, and workers sit together. The reality is somewhat different, because the ILO depends entirely in this regard on, I think, two things. First is the understanding, the acceptance, that we're not in a zero-sum game here. That whatever the trade unions are able to extract is at the expense of the employers. You so they were believe. interdependent. Interdependent, and they have something to gain from working together. In our language, it's called social partnership. In our language, it means this is not, you know, uh, as I say, a zero-sum game. And the governments sort of referee and regulate the process. The second thing is, and I'm going to be very honest with you, this is becoming more difficult, to make a tripartite discussion or organization work, you need people to come to the table willing to listen to each other, willing to accept the legitimacy of the interest offended by each party, and with the effort to compromise. Is that getting harder? It's getting harder. It's getting harder, I think, to, in two dimensions, not for two reasons. One, because international relations is becoming more difficult. So we get, because 187 member states are at the table, we get all of the side winds of everything that's making it more difficult for governments to come together in a multilateral sort of consensus. And secondly, I have to admit, you know, it's getting difficult in the world of work as well. Uh, I find there is more, uh, not exactly confrontational attitudes, but a real difficulty to, 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 if not to find common ground, at least to make the effort to, to, to think that common ground is what we really need to arrive at. So those are two challenges which I'm very okay. honest with you we feel right. Okay, so let me ask about, I want to, I want to just, I'm going to have you word associate a little bit. If, so if I say the word China and the ILO, what's your reaction to that? <laughs> big. Uh, China is big and China is taking on leadership roles in, in, in the ILO in a way, they only came in in the 1980s. They're looming larger and larger in the life of our organization. And I would suggest we are not an exception in the international system that China is ready to fill space, and worse space to be vacated by others, China is offering itself very volubly, very, very clearly uh, as a candidate to take on leadership. Are they a donor to your organization? They, uh, China has this interesting habit of um, still considering itself a developing country, and they pay accordingly. They're a big country. Okay. How much do they pay and how much do we pay? I, well, the United States pays 22% of our regular budget. China has gone up. I'd have to check my figures, but we're in the teens. We're at the low teens. I was the, thinking it was 1%. Pay. Well, that's not... No, no, they've gone up. So that's pretty... Percent. That gets my attention. So if we're doing 21% and they're doing 15... 22, or, 22. If we're doing 22 and they're doing 12, that, that gets my attention. I, is that up from like 1% 10 years ago? It's gone up considerably. I don't think from 1%, but I want to reiterate that is not just a figure for the ILO, that is a the figure global decided system. in New York by the United Nations. Right, so because you're a UN agency, we have as standards. part of saying, okay, the United States is good for 22% across the board, and they've said, okay, China, uh, you're, you're, you need to pay more of the condo fees, so go from 1% to 10%, and so across the board, that's been, okay. That's so. so let me talk about the term, so in the United States, one of the things that has bipartisan support, really, I think, prior, prior to the Bush administration, but has gotten a lot of political energy, has been the issue of combating trafficking in persons. Now, that may not be the term that the ILL uses, but I suspect 
combating trafficking in persons, however you describe it, is something that you all work on. Could, what is your reaction if I use the, you know, maybe you're not going to use, what, how, does, how does the ILO intersect with the issue of trafficking in persons or however you want to call it? Yeah. The language we, we tend to use, but I think we're talking about very similar uh, phenomena. Uh, we talk about forced labor, uh, we talk about modern slavery, and we talk about child labor, and these are clearly overlapping and complementary yes. uh, figures. When we talk about trafficking, there's the idea of movement. You're moving people from one place to another. Uh, forced labor can happen without that type of movement. In any case, on our definition of forced labor, and this is the shocking figure, there's round about 25 million people who are today still victims of forced labor. If you add 15 million uh, people who were forced into marriage, early marriage, uh, that's another 15 million. That gives us a 40 million modern slavery figure. Ugh. If you look to child labor, uh, it's worse. The figure is 152 million, which is it's horrific. It's horrific. With the good news being it's 100 million less than it was if we'd had this conversation in the year 2000. Well, why is it better? What's happened? Uh, what has happened is, uh, and I think the ILO can take a degree of credit in this regard, is actually it was in the 1990s, uh, and it was basically under the leadership of Germany. Uh, there was a major international movement to tackle child labor. Of course. Uh, and we had an international program for the elimination of child labor, which got enormous interest and a great deal of funding, including from the United States. And through sheer hard work on the ground experience, we have worked out what works in the elimination of child labor. And what I think we've been able to do is to uh, give the lie to the notion that somehow child labor is inevitable collateral damage from situations of poverty and underdevelopment. Yes, child labor is related to developmental circumstances but there is no inevitability, uh, inevitability about child labor. We find countries in very similar developmental circumstances, some of which have gone a very long way to eliminating So it's labor. a lie. It's a Others lie to not. say. In some ways, it's a lie if someone says, hey, you just got to wait 10 years while we're working out our development issues. It's a mistake. It's, it's wrong. A mis it's wrong. And experience shows us that. So, so it's not true. So if, some, if someone something. says that, it's not, it's not, that, it doesn't have to be that way. If somebody tells you, sorry, child labor is inevitable because our country is poor or we suffer uh, from developmental barriers, the answer is no, uh, Good. not so. Good. Just, just, can I just do a, a PSA for you? So the first treaty of the ILO was what? Yeah, every year our conference gets together. One of the things we do, less frequently now than previously, is negotiate and the, the governments, workers and employers do it together what we call international labor conventions. These are international treaties which set the rules of the game uh, for labor standards. The very first treaty, 1919, when we were founded, convention number one, is on something as simple and straightforward as working time. And what does convention number one say? It says we want a maximum 40-hour working week, eight-hour working day, two consecutive rest days in the week. You can understand what they were trying to do. You can understand that in 1919, this looked great. This looked like real progress. It so, was real progress. Sorry, guys. So you but, brought the weekend and the 40-hour work week to the world? Amongst other very many good things. Okay. We Just so that. I'm clear about that. Just so we're all clear. Thank you, ILO, Pleasure. for that. Okay. But so, of course, what does that look like today? Now, is the future of work, which we're going to get around yeah, to Yeah, yeah, I to, promise. Is it really, is it, does it look like that? I mean, there's a lot of young people in the room. Do you expect to work five-day week with two days off? Uh, I don't. Nine to five? No. There's a lot of shaking heads. Uh, you know, there's two different questions here. I don't have my young people, I have them working all the time. Well, that's, um, that's a separate conversation <laughs> right, I can right, have right, with yeah. them. Uh, but no, number one, would you like to work that way? Do you expect to work that way? I did a, a straw poll of my interns on that. <laughs> a lot of hands went up to say, I'd love to work that way. Right, Do you in front of you. To? Right. <laughs> so it's interesting. Okay, so, so you guys won the Nobel Prize. Why did you win the Nobel Prize? Well, I was shocked. I didn't things. know that. No, we did. We did won you won the our, Nobel Peace Prize. We won the Nobel Peace Prize on our 50th anniversary. On your uh, 50th, so, so yeah. 69. Yeah, that's right. And, and I think you can... What think for? The 60s. 
Well, because, uh, don't sound so shocked, Dan. Um, <laughs> why? Because I think 50 years, this wild dream, as FDR called it, showed that sitting together with a mandate to, and I'm going to go back to yeah. the mandate, yeah. the promotion of social justice as the only sure guarantee of lasting peace in the world. Does that speak to you today? Does it speak to our current? It really does. And 50 years ago, you know, think back to 1969, people were really into this stuff and they really saw that labor and what happens in labor markets, what happens in workplaces, the capacity to deliver to people. And the 60s were a point of optimism. You know, we're in the middle of what the French call les 30 glories, the, the, the wonderful, glorious 30 years. Came back from the Second World War, yeah. And at least in our societies, not in the developing world necessarily. In the OECD countries. Things were going like that. Yeah. OECD. And so, yeah. And we got, I think, just reward okay. because, can I say that these achievements were historic and they've they remained were historic. historic. You know, I, I've just mentioned one anecdote, yeah, if you'll let me. please. One of my predecessors, it's a great photograph. Uh, there's a great photograph of one of my predecessors, uh, Francis Blochard, shaking hands with Lech Valencia in the place where he was held captive in Warsaw oh, wow. in 1981. Now, if anybody, any organization uh, was able to support and intervene and ensure that Solidarność did what it did in history, it was us. It was us. Well, that's so not really just important. the weekend. Not just the weekend. Huh? But it was, it was something else and as well. Helped you. So I think, I think this is actually very, very important. We just hosted a, um, the National Endowment for Democracy's head, along with the four heads of the four institutes, including the Solidarity Center. And I see some the folks from the Solidarity Center are here. I think we, uh, you know, if you weren't around for it, you will forget that people like Lech Valenza and folks like Lane Kirkland of the sure. AFL-CIA were very, very important in, um, in helping to end uh, communism and, and, and uh, in, yeah. yeah. And Dan, if this sounds like ancient history to the very many young people in the audience, can I just sort of, on the, again, yes. on the Nobel Peace Prize yes. track. Um, two years ago, the Nobel Peace Prize went to the social partners, the workers, the employers, and the Lawyers Association of Tunisia. Oh, Because right. of the role that this coming together of workers, employers, and NGOs had played in ensuring uh, democracy's um, survival in Tunisia. Tunisia is the pilot light of democracy in the Arab world. We got to keep that alive. And the it? following year, the Nobel Peace Prize went to Kaila Satyati, the director of the Global March Against Child Labor for the work done on child well, labor. That's great. So again, this is not self-publicity. So you these guys are part of this. People. You guys are sent front and center at these issues. These are our people. Let me. Guy, tell me about Bangladesh, because I think there's a before and after the Rana Plaza tragedy. I think it's the kind of thing like uh, the Triangle uh, Shirt sure. Factory in sure. the United States was sort of this ca catastrophe. It was sort of a breaking of the social contract. In some ways, in my mind, the Rana Plaza catastrophe was a breaking of the social contract. So you, tell us, what was that? Yeah. Uh, and what has your role been in the response to that? Because I think this is uh, an important part of you, one of the ways in which you, you make a difference. Well, for those of you who, who may not be aware, the Rana Plaza tragedy was a uh, collapse of a uh, ready-made garment factory in Bangladesh in April of 2013. A collapse of a factory where garments which are sourced by household names in this city and many other cities around the world were, were made. The number of people who died in that factory collapse is almost exactly the same number of people who work in my building in mm. Geneva. 1,131. That's outrageous. Young it's outrageous. women. It's horrible. Young women who went to work and, and, and died because they were working in a, a death trap, effectively. And here was a dilemma. Because that sounds like, you know, open and shut case, outrage. You know, the, the initial reaction is outrage. But we know that the ready-made garment industry in Bangladesh um, has been instrumental in lifting an enormous number of people out of poverty, offering employment opportunities, particularly to young women, and giving dynamism to a country which needs a development motor. So we were on the ground at Rana Plaza within days, I think it was three days after the accident. 
the accident, the tragedy. The tragedy. We put together an agreement between the governments, employers and workers of Bangladesh on remedial action, an action plan. We also, and this let me, let me just stop you though, Guy. It strikes me as you're probably one of the only organizations that everybody that you just mentioned would have, could have, or would have trusted to do that. Is I that hope, fair? I hope that, but it, I think that's a fair I, statement. I think it's right. I, I think, think it's, it's a true. fair statement. But I think there's two more bits to this. We got the industry involved. So those household names, uh, all of the shops we shop in on the high streets, they wanted to get involved. And they said, look, uh, if we're going to continue to source in Bangladesh, we expect better from the companies operating in Bangladesh. This is about the sustainability of the Bangladesh industry. I'm not trying to put an end to it. Yeah, I, I, I'm not going to buy shirts that, that are made in death traps. At well, some point, go. the consumer is going to say, is this shirt made in yeah. a death trap or not? Yeah. And, and they're going to say, I'm not going to buy it. And so yeah. the viability of the industry was definitely at stake. You've got it. And, and what really helped us, it wasn't helped, it was decisive, was that the private sector business, and international labor uh, unions came together, adopted an alliance in the court, and said, we are going to work to render this industry safe uh, and to have socially acceptable practices. So since Rana Plaza, five years, I th we have inspected every factory in international supply chain mechanisms. We have Every factory that's in, in, in Bangladesh. It, it, in Bangladesh. On, on the inter there may be some further down the subcontracting chain, which okay. I couldn't swear. But to. is it like a hundred of these? How many no, factories? these are thousands. These are thousands. So you've, gone, you've looked at thousands. You've gone inside thousands of factories. Engineers in and structural engineers have examined the factories and certified them either as safe or um, uh, provided or, or uh, obliged the factories concerned to take remedial actions to correct them. Okay. There has not been a Rana Plaza since. I don't say everything is great in the Bangladesh no. industry, but we've made a hell of a difference. And here's the point. The ILO acting alone, really, as a secretariat, as a, as, as a, as a bureaucracy, can't do that. If we can bring business in, if we can bring labor in, and if we can mobilize resources, and by the way, this cost about seventy-five million dollars of. Uh, so a number of governments assistance. said we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna work with the I we're gonna work through the ILO to do this. Yeah, UK, Canada, the Netherlands, they put big money in, and they're still doing it. Now we've come a long way. Is it perfect? I wouldn't say so, but it's a model of what, you know, this tripartite this this, this organization can do on the ground to make a difference. Okay, so do you work a lot? How do you work with the UN, rest of the UN family? How do you work with the World Bank? How do you work with regional development banks? To, you, you must intersect, your work must intersect with them. How does that happen? Yeah, a, a, a great deal. Okay. Uh, and, and you know, at a time when I think the international system, the multilateral system, the UN, is having to prove its worth more and more yeah. to politicians and to public opinion, yep. there's a real strong uh, obligation upon us to show that we can all work together and deliver better. You know, if every part of the international system works in its corner, you know, we're not going to be very no. impressive. So yes, we do interact. We're working more and more coherently, be it with the World Bank, uh, be it with the UN system itself. And I think we're progressing pretty impressively. The UN is also undergoing a very, very important reform process. So, so if I say SDGs to you, Sustainable Development Goals, what's your, what, how does that intersect with your agenda? We, we, it absolutely, we have, um, Consciously, and I think we were the first part of the UN system to do this, we have aligned our programs to delivery of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. There is one of those goals. This is the UN blueprint to, for sustainable development to 2030. We have one of those goals, SDG number eight, which is specifically about full employment and decent work for all. Okay. So everybody's got a favorite goal, and your goal's eight. Yeah. Well, yes kind and of. no. That's sort of the focus, but all these goals are interrelated. Okay. So we can't just take one goal yeah. and say, we're no, no, no. Do we're, that. we're all about eight. No, we're now, all I, together. I have oddball conversations with people like, Dan, it's goal number six. I have a hard time keeping the Ten Commandments straight, so I have a hard time keeping the 17 UN goals and the 169 sub-indicators straight. But we, we, we try to learn them every day. Every day, every day. Okay, so you, do, so you do interact. Tell me about the work you do with the World Bank Group, because I understand you have a program with the World Bank. We have many programs with the World Bank. I, I, I would Think of the better to, work. Uh, well, this was, yeah, with the International Finance Corporation, yeah, which is the, the private investment arm of the World Bank. 
we have this program called Better Work, and I think there are people in the audience uh, from that different will, yeah. enterprises who work with us. This is a very hands-on, on-the-ground uh, program, started in Cambodia, which basically uh, seeks to work with factories, particularly in the ready-made garment industry, uh, and, and the, the example of Bangladesh speaks to this. Um, we work, we try to work with them to improve their working conditions. We have a monitoring process and we're able to report on, you know, just how well these factories operate, just how fairly they operate. And I think the value of this program is particularly that I think that businesses take an interest in this. And if we're able to have better work operate on the ground, that provides business with certain guarantees that their supply chains can meet certain requirements that I think consumers want to see respected, but also businesses themselves want to see as that you know at least the minima of what they would accept in their own supply chains. So there are plenty of examples, and we can cite some yeah. of them. Egypt is a good example of where having better work operating on the ground, I think, encourages or assures business that these are safe places to source their supply so, chain. So for example, if you said to the Egyptian government, I need you to reform your labor laws in a certain way, and as a result, I can put this better work program in, and as a result of the better work program, a number of companies might come in and establish factories. Is that an example of this? That is the virtuous logic and cycle of what's happening. Uh, now, I'm not saying it's a perfect or you know, sure. silver bullet thing, no. but that is the way we go, and we have many countries who are sort of queuing up to get on the better, uh, the better work program because they know that this is going to be an incentive to business to come and invest. All right, so you're coming up on your 100th year anniversary. You said we need to take stock of where we are um, and you convened. Tell us about this high level commission that you convened and what was the remit that it's had and tell us about some of the things to expect about this because I want to get into this conversation about the future of work. Yeah, uh, well we decided our centenary around the corner that we would dedicate our centenary particularly not just to having a birthday party and applauding ourselves yes. for, for the, the weekend. A big or cake or something. Um, we thought we needed to look to the future, the future of work. Why? Uh, because we feel, and I think many people feel, it is frightening how many organizations are thinking about the future of work. Um, and there's a reason for it. And I think the reason is because we feel, all of us feel, do we not, that the world of work is undergoing extraordinary transformative change. Change of a rapidity, change on a scale, it's global, and change of a profundity, uh, which we, we have to get a grip of. I think we all think that the world of work tomorrow is going to look substantially different from what it is today, and we have to prepare for that. We have to understand it, and we have to prepare for it. That's the first reason yeah. that it's so interesting. The second reason is, and I realize this is a subjective assessment, but I think many people think that the world of work is moving in the wrong direction, not the right direction, in the sense that we see growing inequality in our societies and much of that inequality is incubated in what happens in the world of work. We are worried in the most extreme form, this takes uh, the form of the thesis that there's an end to work, that technology is gonna render work redundant. Now that sounds great, wouldn't you like to have your two day weekend extended to seven days? Yeah. Yeah, except what do we do and how do we live? Was that Wally? That movie Wally's like that, right? Yeah. Basically. Now I don't, uh, I, I don't subscribe to the the end of work thesis, but I think. So you don't, you don't think we're all going to be out of work in fifty years, just having robots do everything? No, for but us. I think what we can expect is that work is going to be not, you know, it's not going to disappear. It's not necessarily going to become permanently and chronically scarce, but it's going to be very, very different. It's going to be performed in ways which it was not performed in the past. I made the reference to the five day week, the weekend, etc. Is the employment relationship where you as an employee have a permanent recognizable employer whose door you can knock on, who can assign say, you boss, a contract? I need a raise. I wonder if that's gonna be. How so, many of us are gonna be working in the gig economy? To what extent are labor contracts gonna be substituted by purely commercial contracts? I want you to work for me for two days to deliver this product, here's the money. That's not a labor contract, it's a commercial contract. 
And technology can facilitate work being done anytime, anywhere, and that changes everything. It's not just Uber, it's not just Airbnb, it's stuff like they're doing specific tasks, having the internet help you disintermediate yeah. that. Well, there's a big debate, Dan, about is this the, the gig economy which is appearing, is this just a niche that will remain a niche in the world of work, or is it a precursor of what is going to become general in the future? And, uh, you know, there's an interesting sort of lesson in all of this. We can look at technological innovation. And here is the point I want to make strongly. With the very same technologies, and I'm thinking of the, uh, the types of digital technologies which are becoming more and more present, we could create a future of work which liberates us, which gives us extraordinary opportunity to choose how we want to work, when we want to work, to reconcile our work responsibilities with private responsibilities. It could do all of those things. But at the same time, and here I quote Chancellor Merkel of Germany, it could lead to the creation of new generations of 21st century digital day laborers. It could make us work like dock workers used to work in the 19th century, mm. queuing up on the dockside for a day's work. Like rural workers used to queue up in the, the market square for a day's work. If the gig economy is Goes to that produce way. that, we're going the wrong way. But it could do the other thing. So here's my point. Yeah. There is no future of work waiting to receive us. The future of work is what we will make of it. It's not the result of robots, technology, globalization. It's a, it's a result of public policy choices and our collective it's choices. It's what people like yourselves decide you want your future to be and our capacity okay. to convince and to influence policymakers to go that way. Okay, so Guy, you are in the, you, you've made your career in the labor movement and the trade unions. What does that mean for trade unions and labor movements? Because I think um, for, they've, been, they've been an important part of civil society. They've been an important part of establishing social contracts. They've been an important part of democracy promotion. Uh, what happens in sort of this gig economy world? What does that mean for, for collective action among uh, employees? It, it's a great question. Uh, my previous meeting before coming here was uh, with the AFL-CIO's Commission on the Future of Work. So they're thinking hard about these things. Look, I, I do come from a labor background. I am unapologetic in my belief that the societies we've created and much of the progress over the last century uh, has been not, of course, exclusively, but very significantly influenced and moved by organized labor and their interaction with business. These have been engines of social progress, equity in our societies. I mean, there's a very simple sort of statistics out there. You know, where collective bargaining is present, where collective bargaining covers more workers, you get more equal societies. You get more equal societies. Now, different people will put a different emphasis, uh, emphasis and valuation on that equity. Uh, I personally place a high value on it. And I think we have now got to a stage, and here, I don't know if I'm going to rub anybody up the wrong way, but I think it is generally accepted that we are reaching levels of inequality in our societies, which are not only socially very, very worrying, they're economically counterproductive. I mean, the International Monetary Fund will tell you, we think that levels of inequality today are damaging for job creation, damaging for growth prospects in the future. And in the end, and here I'm really going near the edge, aren't I? I think the anger we see in our politics, I think the direction that politics and public discourse is taking in very many countries, including Europe, in all of the regions, I think is a reaction to this movement towards levels of inequality, perceived unfairness, which amounts to something which I think goes to the heart of the ILO. It amounts to the feeling out there that somehow there's a social contract which as citizens we all believe we sign up to either implicitly, well, implicitly, not explicitly, I've never signed a social contract. Yeah. But we all think that there are bases of fairness, expectations of what we get in life. If we work hard, obey the rules, you get something back of it. As a feeling that, broke, that, that, that social contract is somehow broken down. People aren't playing by the rules. This is not right. 
And that's a very dangerous set of that's a very dangerous situation. And I think it goes to the heart of democratic process. So do you buy the, the lots of movies about this, sort of the dystopian futures of art, artificial intelligence or the robots are going to, you know, the Terminators like this too, and, uh, you know, uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey and WALL-E. There's, there's a whole universe of films. They're all negative. They're, oh, the future's always horrible, um, and there's dystopian future. So. Where are you? Are you, are you a are you a world of work uh, optimist, world of work uh, future pessimist? What's your where are you? Where do you come down on this? Um, somebody said we all have a duty to be optimists, and, and I feel the duty to be optimistic. That's good. Uh, and uh, it goes back to what I said a few minutes ago. You know, there is no fatality about the future. It's going to be what we make it. Now, we can have very bad outcomes. I have no doubt about yeah. that. I don't go to the dystopian sort of yeah, the, yeah, the, the yeah. film epic piece, but we could create a very unpleasant future of work. I, I had a colleague tell me here at CSIS that um, she's nice to Alexa for because when, when the robots take over, she wants to be passed over by the robots. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we should all hedge our bets, you're right. Hedge um, our bets. <laughs> but, but, you know, the point remains, you know, that is dystopia what we're heading towards or utopia you know there is no single vision someone said you know people say to me if you have a vision for the future people who have visions really need to go and consult a doctor but, uh, <laughs> you know you shouldn't have visions they're hallucinations we have to work now and this is today's politics it's not futurology what do you think the future is going to be like it starts today what do we want the future what do, particularly the young people in the room, what do they want from the world of work? And how are they going to demand it from policymakers? And how are they going to okay. act to bring it about? G Guy, what, tell, tell us about the commission. Who's on it? Yeah. What was the task? Yeah. You got any pre-game? Can you give us some punchlines <laughs> that you know yet that yeah. you, you think will happen? Yeah. Can we talk a little bit about that? And then I want to I do want to spend a minute on what do you think the skills we're going to need in this kind of this world that we're going to be in? After, after you talk about the commission, I want you to tell me, what, what, regardless of what, whether we got robots or flying cars or, I don't know, um, AI writing music or whatever, what are the kinds of skills people are going to need for the future regardless of the, of the future we're going to have? Okay, the commission itself, um, we, we set up a, 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 a high-level commission on the future of work last August. Uh, 28 people on it. We think they're good people. They've got a lot to, uh, to say and to bring. To Two Americans. Desk. There are two Americans. Uh, the co-chairs of our global commission are the Prime Minister of Sweden, Stefan Löfven, and the President of South Africa, Cyril Ramaphosa. So yep. we've got some heft. Heavy duty. Heft. Uh, met three times, going to meet a fourth time in November. This, uh, the report of this commission will be published on the 22nd uh, of January. Uh, now, what can I tell you about that report? Uh, it's going to be short. Uh, it's going to be political, it's going to be strategic, it is not going to be technical and hundreds of pages, and it will be action-oriented with very clear recommendations for action. So you're going to get a... Uh, it'll be in January, it'll be published? 22nd of January. Okay, and so you got any hints for us about what you think some of the punchlines are going to be? Well, short, strategic, etc. Uh, I think there are a number of things which um, are, are, are going to come out of the commission. I'm not the guy who no. signs off on the report. No, but if you were a betting man. Yeah, I think uh, initially there is a point that the commission is going to make. For those people who worry about the future of work, you know, who think that the future of work looks dark. Right, the Terminator, right, yeah. or something. You know, You've got to make a decision here. Either you get defensive, you say we've got to put a break on change, and the solutions for tomorrow's world of work is to go back to what we had yesterday, because that felt safer and nicer and more stable. Or else you have to embrace change, go forward, and basically say, yeah, tomorrow's world of work is going to look and feel different. And I'm sure our commission is going to say, it's not pulling back, it's pushing forward. Okay. So, so, so what? What do I tell my kids the, uh, the, the kind of skills? You're, you've been in this business a long time. What would you tell people in the audience? What would you tell my children that the kinds of skills they're going to need, regardless of the kind of the future that we're going to choose? Okay. What are the kinds of things they're going to need? What makes that 
question really difficult to answer is the pace of change because you know there's many reports out there telling you that I don't know 60% of kids born today will be working in jobs that today do not exist yeah so what do you tell somebody about a job that does not exist it's a nice it's a nice line I'm not quite sure what conclusion okay I'd say four of my last five jobs didn't exist but right. the real point to me is the idea that you can this is what happened to me you learn for the first 20 years of your life you acquire skills in education for the first 20 or so years of your life then you work and then if you're lucky you can retire that's for the gone. last 20 yeah. that's gone it's going to be intertwined because skills acquired at the beginning of a professional career will have a shelf life substantially shorter than the length of your working career so the need for what is commonly called lifelong learning continuous refreshment of skills and education through intertwined processes of uh, working and learning that's going to be the order of the day in the future everybody agrees to that if you talk skills everybody nods their head the question is how do we deliver on this necessity of lifelong learning do you just leave the worker say that's your problem buster yeah. you've got to do it does the state have to provide for this the businesses and employers have to provide for this and how do we deliver on it? And you know, if you put aside the notion of the disappearance of work mm -hmm. in the future, and I do put it aside, the fact remains there's going to be massive transformation. McKinsey's done one of the, I think, the more convincing studies, studies yeah. of, uh, of, 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 of transformation of work. And they say from here to 2030, 15% of the global workforce is going to have to move from the jobs they are currently in to other jobs. And that is a, a transition, a change that we've never had to cope with in the past. And these are not people in formal education, people at the end of their school, beginning of their college life. These are 40, 50 year olds. Now, I, I remember, sorry, I'm not going to go into a, a long anecdote. In Spain, I, I, I dealt with the late minister of Spain when the Spanish construction industry collapsed in 2008. 800,000 people, 40 year olds. Oh my word. Who had left school, not because they were school failures, but because they could earn more on the building site next door than any university graduate could earn. So yeah. at 16, they gave up, went to work on the building site. 20 years later, they had mortgages, kids, families, cars, and they were out of work with no marketable oh skills. God. Uh, no prospects of employment. What do you do with people who are mid-30s, 40 years old? And frankly, it was an insoluble answer. The current Spanish minister would say, yeah, we all became waiters. Basically, they moved into a low productivity service, inflated service sector. Not a good solution. So we have to make this 15% transition of people from here to there. What, what, what about, uh, there's been a, in the developed world, in the, oh, even in, I'm on the board of, a, of an African university called a Shesi, um, but even in Africa you see this where there's an, em an increasing emphasis on university education. Is that going to be relevant in the future? And what, if I said the term uh, vocational technical training, what, what's your reaction to the term vocational technical training? Hey, you know, in a conversation we had this morning with, with colleagues from the AFL-CIO, they say, why is vocational training, apprenticeships, trade education regarded and stigmatized as second best? Why do parents and young people still want to send the kids to university, even if labor market signals tell them you can get a better job, you can earn more money from a trade education? And it's a bit of a mystery, huh? Uh, I see it not just in the United States, but across the world. Vocational technical education is somehow second best. It's, a, it's just a what the people who can't get into university uh, tend to do. And people can't understand why this is. I actually think it's got to do with the fact that we're not simply you know, rational economic human beings. We attach value to education. And status. Which goes beyond the, yeah, the material yeah, yeah. returns. Well, a lot generates. of universities are oftentimes sort of a dating service too, right? I mean, it's a, you meet your, meet your spouse. You yeah, probably had a better time at university I, than yeah, I Yeah, maybe. But, uh, I don't, uh, but I do get the point. You get the point. <laughs> but I was on a boat on, this weekend with a person who has two associate's degrees 
and he runs a plant company. So you go and buy, you plant trees and this sort of a thing. He's a multi, multi-millionaire. He's very, you know, he's, he does not have a PhD and doesn't really have a formal university degree in the US context. Employs 50 people, mainly from Mexico. And I said, well, okay, well, what's gonna happen when the robot, are you gonna have robots? And he said, well, you know, when I first started 50 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, and he, he pointed his big, massive McMansion he was building on the river. You know, he's not, not missing a meal. This guy's doing great. He said, you know, uh, we, everyone had to build, dig the plants out with, the, with, a, with a, a pickaxe and a shovel. Today we've got these special machines. I don't know what they're called, but they're these like highly specialized diggers with augers and, you know, it's like a kind of a, kind of a robot, but not really. He said, we're going to have those that are, even we're going to have drones. He was talking about drones, and they're, we're going to have um, special uh, special robots to carry heavy weights. He said that's coming in the next ten years in my industry, but they're going to assist the worker. Sure. They're not going to replace the worker. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, well, but I think this is a challenge, is it not? Uh, and you know, I, I think everybody, and this is much easier to say than it is to, to work through into operational terms. We have to, you know make sure that we master technologies more than the technologies master us. And it goes very closely to what you say. You know, there's nobody, I think, who has any real interest or understanding of the history of, of labor in, through the years who will regard technology as anything other than positive in the sense that I always say that technology can, has freed human beings from uh, the four D's, I hope I can remember them all, from dirt, from drudgery, from danger, from deprivation. There are lousy jobs, there are really jobs nobody yeah. wants to do that technology have relieved us from. Technology is an emancipatory instrument without which the world of work cannot advance. So, you know, that we should regard technology as a danger or a threat yeah is somehow counterintuitive and it's counter to our history. And yet, and yet, and yet, all those things you're talking about, these are not illusions. No. These are not illusions. But we have to make the management of technological innovation a subject to policy. Is, is this whole coding thing, is that like a fetish? Is that like a baloney thing? I see all these people saying everyone's got to go code. How many people are really going to code in the future? I think that's like, I, 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 don't know, I don't know if I believe that. Now, I know it's like a trendy thing to say everyone's got to code. What's your take on coding? I haven't got a take on coding, really. Um, but what you know, I can say... And you say, know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I do, but how much I understand it's another matter. Uh, I spent yesterday afternoon sitting in a so-called techno hub in New York, in yeah, midtown Manhattan, yeah. with young startup entrepreneurs who were doing things which... I'm, I'm not being funny. I mean, it's yeah. beyond probably yeah. the comprehension of most people here. Yeah. And I didn't ask them about their technology, although their technologies were extraordinary, the things they were doing were extraordinary. I asked them about their business models. Okay. I asked them about their business models. These were you know, people in their 20s who were sitting in a, uh, an open space in, 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 in midtown Manhattan, rent-free, courtesy of the city of New York, and incubating startups that were making millionaires. You know, I mean, these, these people were on their way to becoming millionaires. Right. I asked them not about how many millions, I asked them about their labor practices. How many people they employed, on what terms, how they saw the career development. And when I said the word your employees, they sort of frowned. They said, uh, who do you mean? Right. <laughs> they contract people. They contract people for a job and they go. They decide how they're paid according to what they negotiate individually with those people. Zero job security, zero social protection. This looked like their business model for the future. But when I asked them about the social and labor uh, implications of what they're doing, I really got the impression this was the first time anybody asked themselves that question, and certainly the first time they had asked themselves that question. Yeah. Now, I'm not criticizing them. This was just what I took away from that meeting. No, I think that's a real, I'm sure that was the first time they'd ever even considered that. So, so okay, you all have been a very patient uh, audience. I'd love to hear from, uh, from some of you. Um, so who's got, I'd love to, I've got plenty of questions otherwise. So love to, I, I wanna call on some folks. Um, okay, this woman here, this woman here with the, the blue shirt. So this woman here in the, in the black sweater. 
Am I here? Okay, and then this woman here in the blue sweater, this gentleman in the tie, and this woman over here. Okay, and we'll get to, right. we'll do two rounds of these. Go Frank, ahead. Yeah. Name, organization, keep it short. Yes. Stand right. up. Oh. Okay. <laughs> He's yes, stand sir. Up. Yes. Okay. Okay. It's a bit like that, isn't it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Hi, yeah. I, I'm Mindy Reiser. I'm a sociologist. I'm also on the governing board of the D.C. chapter of the Labor and Employment Relations Association. So that's a good group for you to know about. Okay, in terms of the employer component of the ILO, I'd like to hear about the disjunction maybe or collaboration between those companies that are part of mega mergers, the very large corporations, and then the, the mid-level, which Germany has so much pride in. How do these very different entities collaborate? What kind of entities can you help them uh, focus on and support? And where then do the small businesses fit into this whole constellation? Okay, great. Thank you for modeling brief. So everyone, get, you get extra credit if you keep it short. So name, you, you ma'am, name, organization, keep it short. Hi, my name is Eleanor Martinez. I'm an intern with the Millennium Project, a futurist think tank here in DC. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, as we see the rise of this gig economy and also the rise of automation that um, kind of takes over a lot of low level jobs, things like truck drivers, for example. Yeah. Um, what do you think of policies such as the idea of universal basic income? Do you think okay. that's a feasible policy solution to problems okay. like that? Okay. This gentleman here in the suit. Very sharp suit, by the way. Thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. And yeah. I'm very privileged to see you, DJ, okay. dear DJ, after the G20 Summit in Turkey, where okay. I had a chance to N work with you. So Your name, my sir. Question, my name is Ozan, and uh, I'm ex-ILO. Okay, so good. Okay. Seven years with the colleagues. And uh, my question is that, in one hand, we have the unprecedented uh, levels of the human mobility, including, you know, the forced displacement, migration, and refugee, you know, the crisis. On the other hand, we have the emerging forms of the employment, either gig to the gig economy or the, you know, the unconventional way of doing the work remotely. So how, uh, you know, the fundamental pillars of decent work can reconcile these different needs, mm -hmm. the different, you know, the, uh, the different challenges okay. of today's world. Thank you so much. Okay, this woman over here. Hi, thank you so much for the great conversation. I'm Abby McGill with the Solidarity Center. Um, my recollection of how the weekend was formed was not that the ILO benevolently uh, bestowed that upon us, but that you had people in the streets demanding eight hours of work, eight hours of sleep, eight hours to do as you will. And I'm wondering, you know, as we talk about the fears of the new economy, how much of that is actually old school problems just rising up again? And what is the ILO view as like the best solution to these new school problems, the old school solution of ensuring that um, employers and governments do not have freedom at will to collude together to give more and more power to corporations and less and less power to people themselves to band together and collectively bargaining for better conditions. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Let's start with those four. I'll start, I'll start with those. The first question, um, if, I, if I, I've captured it uh, properly, is about employer uh, representation at, at the ILO. Um, the people, and uh, imagine yourselves as governments, workers, and, and employers, you people are not generally the heads of enterprises. They tend to be the representatives of employers' organizations. So, for example, the U.S. employer representative uh, is nominated and represents the United States Council for International Business. And there's an important point here. The mandate, and it's normal, the representative mandate for employers in the ILO is not generally held by the representative of an, an enterprise, a multinational or a small enterprise, but by an employer's organization. And this creates a structural, I mean, this is normal because they have the representational mandate, but it does mean uh, that the ILO um, has to mediate, if you like, its way of interacting directly with enterprises. And what we see very clearly is there are different expectations, I think, from large enterprises, multinational enterprises, uh, the, the familiar names that we all know about, and the small and medium-sized enterprises. One thing the ILO does on a very large scale today, which it did not do 20 years ago, is promotion of, uh, of entrepreneurship 
and small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, over the last 10 years, we have provided training in entrepreneurship to no less than 6 million people, often young people, often in developing countries. So now, in that sense, small and medium-sized enterprises are the beneficiaries of direct technical cooperation from the ILO. Representation depends very much on the nature of the organization concerned. But if the organization that occupies the employer benches at the ILO encompasses both multinational business, middle size, and middle stand, as you mentioned from, from Germany, and small businesses, then hopefully we get um, a, a comprehensive representation. Uh, that is the answer. I think there is a concern. Mm -hmm. I, 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 we, uh, I think we have to face it that trade unions, of course, in their representative processes have their own problems. On the employer's side, I think there are some businesses which are now so big and so powerful and have so much access to relate to the other question, uh, to decision makers, that they do not feel the need to act through representative employers' organizations. I suspect you feel that in the United States. And that can represent a certain fragmentation of representation with which we have to uh, contend. Uh, the second question, um, the gig economy, um, uh, the, um, you know, the destruction of low-skilled jobs by automation, uh, these are absolute realities. Um, I think there are, the one thing I would say about that is I think the great worry that I have that if uncorrected, technological innovation would exacerbate existing inequalities unless we have countervailing action taken to, uh, to prevent that from happening. One solution which is um, often cited, and you've mentioned it, is the idea of universal basic income. Uh, I see that sort of recommended on, on, on the basis of two thoughts. One is there will be chronic job scarcity in the future, so that you know, if work is not uh, uh, there for people to have an income, we have to provide other means, UBI being the answer. The second is, well, yes, there will be work, but it will be intermittent, it will be on the gig, so this month you get a lot, next month you get nothing, so you need some way of leveling that out and having predictability. Um, our commission is talking a lot about universal basic income, so the opinion you're going to get is Guy Ryder's opinion. <laughs> I, I think I, I'm not a fan of universal basic mm. income. Uh, I don't think it's a, um, I, I don't take the view that um, we should be giving up on work as a primary, indeed, necessary source of income and activity. I regard as dystopian, Dan, the notion of even if we could provide a decent UBI for people, the notion that we exist in society but do not work. Because work has a value, and by the way, this is very present in the thinking of our commission, work has a value which goes beyond the material well-being it brings. Um, it's about our self-fulfillment. It's about meaningfulness. It's about purpose. Yes. People's eyes tend yes, to glaze yes, over I when I say Yes, I agree with you. This. No, I agree with it you. It sounds like soft and No, fuzzy. no, no, it's, it's good. Yeah, Arthur yeah. Brooks, who's at the, the president of the American Enterprise Institute, had an important piece about sort of earned success. Yeah. And this is related to this point. And I think it's right. Sigmund Freud said it quite well. Uh, you know, work is what connects the individual to reality. Mm. And, it's, and it's good, huh? That's good. And when that link is broken, people suffer psychologically from it. So It's true. So I'm not a big fan of UBI. I don't believe it to be necessary, and I think it's a false solution. Uh, and I think it represents giving up on work, and I'm not ready to do that. Am okay, I, I'm, I'm doubling down. Amen. I totally agree, Guy Ryder. I totally agree with that because when my grandfather, at the end of World War II, was in charge of um, prisoners of war, he said that the worst thing you can do is have a person not do anything. Yeah. And that that is a soul-crushing thing. That's a bad thing. It truly is. Yeah. Okay. I'm with you. I'm with you. Okay. To go on to the, the, the next question from my former colleague, um, you know, I think there are a number of things at work uh, in the world which mean that whether people like it or not and find it easy or difficult to deal with, mobility, migration uh, is going to be a big part of the future of work. Uh, oh, yeah. Here is the dilemma of the moment. I think the economic case for increased migration has never been stronger. Yeah, but the borders are closing. And yet the political and social obstacles to migration are becoming ever greater I mean, as you, well. Can you think of a European country that's going to take a million folks anytime soon? I mean, I don't think, I think that game is over. Well, I think that ship has sailed. I don't think when Merkel, you know, I, I don't see Merkel raising her hand saying, I'm, doing, I'm good for another million. 
I think that's over, you know. So I, th I, think, I think the borders, we just did a big task force on forced migration here. I visited 10 countries, I interviewed 300 people, we had a bipartisan task force. We, we got a big, I agree with you, this is a big part of the future guy, but um, I, I, can, I, can, I understand the economic argument behind it, but I would tell you the political will in OECD countries no, no. is, oh, I mean, I was, I, Korea took 500 Yemenis and it's been complicated. No, no, right? Listen, I agree, and, and, and I repeat what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, the economic case has never been stronger, the political and social obstacles have never been higher. And they're going higher. So we've got to unlock that dilemma. Why? Just look at demographics. You know, all of our countries which are getting older, you know, the rich North is getting older. Yeah. Uh, we're going to need, we're going to need somebody to pay our pensions to keep the things going. And we're seeing in the young countries of the world, and as we worry about aging, let's not forget that Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia still have a lot of growth to the, go. The growth. What, We're going to see a doubling of the population of Africa well, in the next go. 25 yeah. years. And if anybody believes that uh, you know migration is going to be stopped or prevented, no. or, uh, we need it, we have to manage it. And I think one of the great <sighs> policy failures of the world, I'm not speaking about the United States, no. I'm happy to speak about Europe, yeah. is our absolute failure to manage migration rationally and in a way which uh, I, I think you know, brings countries together rather than divides them. This has been exacerbated by, and the, co and the colleague mentioned it, this has been exacerbated by the refugee crises, which has led to a, you know, a, 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 a very, very strong shock, reaction uh, due to conflicts which we've been unable to, to, to resolve. I was, in, I was in Eritrea three weeks ago for about three days, so it makes me the world's expert on Eritrea, sure. right? So I know everything there I know is about Eritrea. My, and there have been a lot of Eritreans who have left and have shown up on boats in the Mediterranean. Boats. And if you said, okay, well, what, why are people leaving Eritrea? And shouldn't we just give them a big Marshall Plan to fix Eritrea? That's not the problem in Eritrea. The problem in Eritrea is they've got this crazy frozen conflict with Ethiopia over a one-horse town. But they seem to be getting Yeah, yeah, to... we're going to get peace in our time. But my point is... As a result of your visit, uh, I've Yes, no absolutely. Doubt. Of course, to, uh... you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> so, so, so they've got this... They had this 100,000 people died over a one-horse town. Um, and they have this frozen conflict. And so the Eritreans have national mobilization. And so everyone, if you get conscripted into their army, you're on the hook to be on the army for 40 years. And so after like year eight, you're just like, you know, I've kind of given at the office. I think I want to try something new. How's Italy? I think I'll try Italy. So they, they all end up on boats. And so it wouldn't be about, you know, giving them a whole big pile of aid money. It's about getting peace in our time. And if you got peace in our time, that would reduce their need to have a, a unlimited, unending, um, yeah. Uh, uh, conscription and therefore people wouldn't get on boats or at least a lot less of them would get on boats. That was my deep you're right. thought. You, right? Of course you're right and, 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 I, I, and I fully uh, hear what you're saying. Okay, well Eritrea. I take all the credit for the peace in the last you four should. weeks. That was Absolutely. me, so you're welcome, like I but said. My point would be the following. There are, you know, the mixed flows, the reasons why people are on the move, have there are various reasons. Mm -hmm. One is escape from conflict, one is escape from repression, mm -hmm. sort of thing. One is simply lack of economic opportunity. Uh, and we have to address all of these things. You know, you know, again, Chancellor Merkel in Germany talks about a Marshall Plan for Africa, and they want to put money into it, partly as a defensive measure because all of the problems Germany is facing now, but partly because this is what needs to be done in Africa. And I would suggest we might be facing something not dissimilar in Central America right now. Uh, you know, you, you've got to, there, there are some, there are some pressure points in yeah. the world, Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, yeah. increasingly Central America, I'm yeah. not trying to dramatize here, where we have, and no one country is going to do this. Uh, I, I'm totally to in agreement with together. you. We, we, we need 25 planned Colombias. We need 25 Alliance for Prosperities in countries all over the world that are going to be collective action, planned Colombias for countries like Eritrea and Uganda and you know, if you look at the Alliance for Prosperity in the Northern Triangle, we, that's yeah. what we're going to need yep. along those lines. That's what we're going to ultimately. Uh, and yes, move please. on to the last question. Yeah. Old school, new school solutions. There are old school problems that appear in new clothes. I mean, I mean, you know, what I've said about the, the gig economy, you know, 21st uh, century technologies can be applied in the worst cases 
uh, to reproduce 19th century labor practices. You no, know, work on call, be it, you, know, you know, through a, the gig economy, or st as I said, standing on the dockside waiting for the, the foreman to say, you'll have a job for the next day. We have to work our way through these things. I believe you've talked about collusion and power. I wouldn't use that language. What I would talk about is a basic respect for rights at work and basic considerations of equity, uh, both at work and in society. I don't think, however rich you are, however well off you are, however well placed you are in a society, you can feel comfortable, secure, or happy living in societies of ever greater inequality. In the end, we're all victims of that. Wherever you're placed in the, the league table of wealth, if you're living in, in situations In some walled-off community or something. Off, or you need body, Or you need bodyguards. Yeah, and not just because it's uh, non-sustainable or dangerous. Do we want to live like that? Yeah. Does it make us feel good? I, I think, uh, this is my view, I think that the reason Plan Columbia happened and the Colombian people were ready to fix things in the year 2000 was that when the wealthy couldn't go to their, their uh, ranches anymore because the guerrilla war was so bad and sort of the easy workarounds were, were out, they were out of luck on using the workarounds, that's when the society said, okay, now I'm ready to spend more money to defeat the guerrillas but also have a different kind of a conversation about the social contract in Colombia. That's my, my, my editorial view on that. Okay, let's get another round of, okay, I wanna hear from Alex Kravitz. I wanna hear from that gentleman, that great tie, green tie, I'm a sucker for green ties, okay? Um, this woman here, and let's see, and this woman here, okay? So Alex, the green tie, uh, this woman in the blue dress, and um, this woman in the white shirt, okay? Alex. Uh, Alexander Kravitz, I served as a former delegate to, to the ILO convention. Thank you for a great, a great panel uh, to both of you. Uh, two quick questions. What is the ILO, do, I wonder if you could share with us what the ILO is doing in terms of good governance practices uh, within the labor uh, sector, particularly labor unions, you know, elections, financing, and so forth. And the second question, since you're here in the United States, you talked about the ILO conventions. There's something like 189, 100, almost 200. Uh, and of those, eight are the core fundamental uh, con conventions. Yeah. Of these, the United States has approved only 14, uh, whereas there's something like 90% approval uh, worldwide. And of the eight core conventions, the United States has approved only two. How does that hamper your work and globally? And what are you going to be telling if you're meeting with Congress or you're meeting with the administration about encouraging U.S. ratification of uh, ILO conventions. Okay, no Coca-Cola for you. you. On the spot, Alex, no cookie for you after this. Thanks, thanks for asking <laughs> the, the uncomfortable question. Okay, green tie. Hi, I'm Matt Hobson with the International Youth Foundation. Um, we just published our annual report, the theme of which was the future of work. And one of the things that we talked about was the importance of soft skills. And I know that soft skills are also part of the um, decent jobs for youth initiative in many of the priority areas. Um, so our take was that soft skills are important not only because of their, you know, the inherent work readiness, but also that they prepare young people for an uncertain future where lifelong learning will become a big part of their lives. So I wonder if you could just talk a little okay. bit about how you view, view soft skills in this uncertain future where lifelong learning okay. will be critical. Hi everyone, my name is Elizabeth DeFries. I'm with World Learning here in D.C. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about sector specific looking into the future. I think that 50 years ago we look at tourism and we didn't realize how global of an industry would become, especially in developing regions. So my takeaway is kind of jobs of the future. We might not know what those jobs are yet, but sectors that do exist and could exist in the future, could you dive a little deeper into those? Okay, and this, this woman here, please. Thank you for the conversation. I am an immigration reporter from the Purdue News Service. So my question is, how do you think Donald Trump's uh, immigration policies, such as cutting down the number of H-1B visas, this is great. Are, are, changing, are changing the, the world of work or the migration of labor forces? So, so specifically, H-1B visas and what's this mean for the world of work? Yeah. Okay, and you're with the journal, news service, right? Yeah, sure. This is great, love Thank it. Thank you. Thank you so much, okay, okay. Me? Yep. 
I guess that's why they pay you the big bucks, guy. Oh my that, word! That last one's beyond my pay grade. They, they, however, they, they, um, the IYF just did this course on uh, this book report on soft skills. I'm sure you're going to yeah. use all your soft skills <laughs> for some of these questions. Okay. Um, on, on, on the first question, um, look, good governance. Uh, you, you mentioned um, we regard uh, the uh, you know, proper governance of workers being uh, one of our you know promoting good governance of workers being one of our primary responsibilities. A lot of thoughts and a lot of um, issues sort of can fly under that banner of good governance. It means, and this is often ignored, labor administrations, labor ministries. If you go to any country, I mean, I think particularly the developing world, but yeah. not exclusively, who is at the bottom of the pecking order in governmental organization? It's generally labor ministries. They really are the poor relation uh, of, of government spending. So we see, I think, an alarmingly weak governance of work in the very m most basic notions of labor administration. You can talk about labor administration, you can talk about labor inspection, you can talk about record keeping, you can talk about information systems, really bad. And we don't invest enough in these things. And I think the case for investment in these, uh, in these uh, uh, functions uh, is not being made strongly enough. Now, we provide a lot of technical support uh, through the ILO to labor ministries to help them to upgrade what they do. But the governance of work from a governmental point of view is very weak. You have other issues of, of the governance of work. I mean, we're seeing increasing uh, commitment from the business community to volu voluntary, uh, uh, voluntary initiatives of how they govern the behavior of their, uh, their own companies, but also the supply chains which supply those uh, companies. This is becoming a particularly important area of work. And I think there's a lot to be worked out between what properly belongs in the public policy sector, the responsibility of government properly, and what the private sector can reasonably be expected and be in a position to take on. You've mentioned uh, trade unions and all the rest. We have very clear, and this is sort of ingrained in our uh, standards, uh, very clear principles about um, you know, the autonomy and independence of, of worker and indeed employer organizations. They should be free from uh, illicit and uh, 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 unjustified interference. One way governments can and do interfere in, in trade unions uh, is by subjecting them to over, in, uh, in, in, in over, how can I put it, enthusiastic inspection of their activities. Trade unions, like any other private body, need to obey the rules of the games in terms of financial reporting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. No less, but certainly no more. The United States does not stand out um, as a major ratifier of ILO conventions. The point is made. Uh, 14 uh, conventions ratified. Out of, you mentioned the 200, but there's only about 80 of, of those which are really today current because as time goes on, new conventions replace old conventions that they revise. Uh, we just keep the numbers going, but a lot of conventions are basically on the shelf. So, but 14 is a small number. And you've mentioned particularly that we have a subgroup of conventions, there are eight of them, uh, which define fundamental rights at work, define human rights at work, and they are conventions that protect the right to organize, the right to bargain collectively, two conventions which cover freedom from forced labor, two conventions which, dis uh, which cover protection from child labor, and two conventions uh, which uh, uh, cover discrimination along various gender and other criteria. The United States has only uh, ratified two of those. You've, now, what are the prospects of me knocking on the door of Congress or the Senate and saying, hey, get some ratifications underway. Um, I'm not about to do that. That's not how, how things work. Probably unlikely. Um, but here's an interesting thought. The United States makes extensive reference to these conventions, for example, in its trade policies and its expectations of other countries. Uh, ILO conventions, particularly on fundamental rights, are very, very clear, and I'm not imagining this, these are explicit reference, point, reference points of US international policy. So there's, 
there's a sort of a question mark often posed uh, to the United States in that regard. I don't have an easy answer to how we unlock that one. We encourage all of our member states to consider ratification of conventions, and most particularly the eight fundamental rights conventions for which we have an open and continuing uh, campaign for universal ratification. Some of those conventions are near universal ratification. However, if I take one convention, I'm not going to labor this any further, Dan. Convention number 87, it's about the right to organize. Um, that's been ratified by a very high number of ILO member states. But the fact remains, here's, here's the irony, that half of the world's labor force works and lives in countries which have not ratified that convention because the United States has not ratified it. China has not ratified it. India has not ratified it. Brazil has not ratified it. So the pure numbers of member states ratifying is not always a guide to, um, to, uh, uh, to what follows. Da, da, da. What's the next one? Soft skills. If you want to get a question in, obviously you have to wear a green tie in, yes. in the room. Uh, that's good for the next that time, works. isn't it? Uh, soft skills, um, look, the way we take it, and, and you made a lot of points which I would simply um, subscribe to and nod my head to, but how do we look at the soft skills? I think we see them in a continuum in, a, in, this, in, in this context of lifelong learning. Uh, it seems to us, and I think all the evidence shows uh, that success in educational uh, achievement, success in skills acquisition uh, in the longer term um, depends really quite directly on what happens very early on. Early childhood learning is really important beyond its immediate impact. So we have to see, I think, the soft skills in the continuum of early childhood learning, foundational skills, foundational education skills, and then what we tend to call cognitive skills, which include learning how to learn. Because if learning is going to be a lifelong process, we have to have the skills to be able to acquire yeah. new skills as we go along. And soft skills and cognitive skills, I think, are a package of our capacity to do that, as well as all of the other things about communication, empathy, the things that really we need to make sure that um, uh, we, can, uh, we can succeed at work. The sectoral approach is very interesting. Uh, it, it, it's good that we talk about this. Um, there are some sectors which are commonly identified and the ILO identifies as being really promising generators uh, of, of jobs in the future. Whether you would call them exactly sectors, I don't know, but I'm going to have a go at it. Um, one is care, the care economy. Uh, for things that we've referred to already, demography, aging society, but also child care. And this is also a key to gender equality at work because we know uh, from our poll work that uh, probably the biggest barrier globally to women's entry and advancement into the labor force is the availability of care facilities and the equitable sharing of care responsibilities. So the care economy uh, needs, I think, to be a major part of the future, not simply provision of care, but the professionalization uh, of the care economy. Much care today is undertaken outside the monetized labor market. It doesn't appear in GDP figures. We actually have to dig the roots out there. So we have to take a high road to care. We have to value care. And we have to make sure that care facilities are available in such manner as enables particularly women to access labor market on a basis of greater equity. So the care economy. Now, this isn't exactly a sector, but the green economy. Uh, you know, our future, I don't want to go into the uh, controversies around climate right. change sitting but here. But environmental stewardship. But, but green jobs are going to be a big part of the future. And this in itself, even if we abstracted from all of the other factors which are leading to, you know, turbulence and uh, transformative change at work, um, our productive systems are going to have to change radically if we are to um, mitigate and stop and to break climate change. Most people, not everybody, accepts that climate change is a result of human activity and in large measure that human activity is work or work related. So the green economy of the future is also 
a sort of a sectoral uh, thing that we have to look at. You can abstract from these things and say, yeah, but are we going to work in industry or services or in agriculture? This is the way people tend to sort of put the big lumps of our uh, economies together. Um, I think you know, we see this secular migration from uh, agriculture to industry and industry to services. This is a classic thing that we've come to accept as normal. I think that's going to look a bit different in the future. Not least because industry is going to look, if we can talk about industry in the future, it's going to be something quite different. And agriculture and the rural economy has not got to be the residual. It's not got to be the place. We've got to feed 9.5 billion people. We've got to feed people and we've got to anchor people. You know, I mean, the rural world cannot be the place where people work simply because they can't get out and get to something better. We've got to do better on agriculture and the rural economy and I think of the developing world in particular. And finally, I've been delaying it as long as I possibly can. Um, <laughs> Donald Trump and migration. I'm not gonna really answer that question very directly, partly out of self-protection and partly out of ignorance of the specifics. But I will make a more perhaps general comment, uh, bring in my soft skills. Yes, play use your, and, full, all, your full array of soft skills. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, just, I, I just came from the United Nations, which in Friday of last week adopted, endorsed, it has to be adopted at the end of the year. There's the compact, compact on migration and refugees. Safe, orderly and regular migration. With the notable exception of the United States which bailed out of that process. On the one on migration, we're still in the one on refugees. Yeah, but migration, the United States has opted out of what is for all of its weaknesses, and it has weaknesses, the attempt of the global community to come up with a basic compact about how to manage migration. Now, everybody is disappointed that the United States cannot subscribe uh, to, to this global compact. One worries that other countries might bail out uh, before it's adopted in Marrakesh at the end of the year. But I think it does underline something which I, I think is fundamental. If every country individually tries to manage migration on its own, and by the way, Europe demonstrates this very, very vividly, we're not going to get to any type of result which is going to have any chance of addressing the magnitude of the issues under consideration. It's just by its very nature, axiomatically, <coughs> not going to happen. You know, in the era of globalization, we've not done a bad job with all of the problems of regulating the flows of capital, the flows of goods, the flows of services. We haven't even begun at the global level to regulate and to uh, manage the flow of human beings. And there is something ironic and wrong about that. Okay. We have to do it better. All right, we well, need to end it here. Please join me in thanking the Director General. Thanks, Guy. Okay, good.
Thank you.